Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Minkowski. I, I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Washington doing um, a PhD in biomedical and health informatics. And as my focus for my dissertation, I'm focusing a lot on fire and the interoperability opportunities that it brings to healthcare. Um, so for the last two or so years, I've been um, playing around with Fire, doing some pilot projects, uh, some smart Spartan Fire apps, some other um, <clears throat> efforts. And then over the last year or so, I started um, really focusing on like compiling some educational material and, and create and like jump starting a community around fire in the Seattle area. So a lot of the um, a lot of the content of this tutorial is kind of a um, compilation of a lot of the materials that we've presented over the last couple uh, months at um, different uh, lectures to different groups. Uh, we organized a workshop um, last fall. Uh, so I tried to link out to as many of those um, resources as possible, both the ones that we created or the ones that we found were really useful. Um, and by we, I mean um, this little group that we jump started called UW Fire, where um, a lot of these tutorials and uh, materials are located. So just to quickly show you a... Um, where this uh, actual tutorial lives. It lives actually in the, um, in the UW Fire um, GitHub group under OpenMRS Fire webinars, where I've put all the educational materials that I want to work, uh, work with. And if you ever want to check it out, you can just go to this GitHub page that I linked to and um, take a look at this post here and give us feedback, give me feedback on what we, I can improve about this tutorial. Okay, so let's jump into it. Um, here are the couple learning objectives. Um, I really kind of uh, wrote this tutorial at how I approach FIRE and how I wanted to learn about it um, and what I thought might be the most important things to know to really get a foundational um, kind of foundational background on what this uh, this uh, word means, why it you hear it in healthcare all the time right now, and what um, fire can actually um, bring to healthcare, and also what it can't do. So. Um, the first learning objective is recognize the basic features and uses of modern web APIs and also uh, talk about how FHIR fits into this um, class of web APIs that are used throughout the larger technology landscape, not just in healthcare. Um, understand the general concepts behind the FHIR standard for healthcare data exchange, um, which includes its history, its purpose, you know, scope, to what extent it's being adopted and by whom, and how these implementations both differ from each other and um, from the uh, definitions of the spec, the, the standard itself. Um, then we'll talk about some major projects and co collaborations and other technologies that are directly related to FHIR or use FHIR as a backbone, because I think that's where FHIR really has the most potential it can become a language of healthcare in basically um, a huge variety of uh, applications from mobile apps to uh, EHRs to um, public health uh, uses. So it has, it's basically very universal for what it can be used for. And there are many projects already that um, have built on top of it to provide other um, services. Then we'll quickly um, run through a Jupyter Notebook Fire mm. tutorial um, that uh, that hopefully mm. will take what we just read and learned about and uh, and actually show how we can query a Fire server 
get some data about a patient. Of course, this will be dummy data from a um, from a server that just has fake data, but how we can query that data from a patient, um, do some calculations on it, and uh, calculate a cardiovascular risk score based on that data. <clears throat> then I'll just give a quick list of um, all of these cool other resources, tutorials, um, uh, pages, readings that might uh, interest you guys if you want to explore um, further independently. Um, and finally, hopefully we'll have time, um, we'll uh, have a quick conversation about um, what FIRE can bring to the OpenMRS community and what um, what your guys' experience is uh, at where it could fit into how you, you know, all the work that you do for OpenMRS. Um, so yeah, anyone have any questions about that? Does that sound good? Does that sound not that great? No questions from me. Okay. Looks exciting. No questions <laughs> from we me. Can make it a bit exciting. Okay. Looks exciting. So let's first start with a general overview of what FIRE is. And I wanted to link this overview to the official documentation um, from the um, FIRE website. So um, first of all, FIRE stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. Um, so it's a clever little acronym for a couple of slightly confusing words. Um, but according to their official documentation in the summary page here, which I'll make a little bigger, um, FIRE is a next generation standards fr framework created by HL7 that combines um, the features of some of their old uh, standards while leveraging the latest web standards and applying a tight focus on implementability. Um, like, like this quote said, FIRE is considered the next generation sta standard for HL7. And the HL7 organization itself is um, basically a not-for-profit standards committee for healthcare that has had a hand in a couple of the standards um, widely used, uh, including HL7 v2, HL7 v3, and CDA documents, which are related to HL7 v3. Um, we're not really going to go into this history uh, too deeply because uh, we want to focus on fire in this walkthrough, but um, I linked to a slide deck and a little tutorial walkthrough on HL 7v2 um, that you might want to check out. Um, and if you have any other questions or want to uh, find out more about it, just let me know um, on Slack or on the talk post. So um, the main takeaway is that the previous HL7 standards, v2, v3, and CDA, are still used and can't be um, disregarded. They're still in wide use today to varying degrees, but FIRE seems to be the next um, big thing and it's, it's growing fast, it's maturing fast, and has wide range of uh, adoptions. Um, and this, all of these um, stats are very US centric because that's where most of uh, my information came from and that's where I've been kind of working. But um, FIRE in uh, recent years especially has gained a lot more traction globally as well. And um, the use cases it attempts to represent um, also represent a now a more um, general view of healthcare, not one that is um, US centric. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Yeah, so I, here's no. another uh, post that I linked to if you want to do some more reading um, on the healthit.gov website for the U.S. government about um, 
why fire might be about to uh, gain even more um, momentum. So if we go back to the, um, the summary that the, the FIRE website gives, they talk about the fact that FIRE leverages the latest web standards and applies a tight focus on implementability. Um, what does that actually mean? So the standards that FIRE actually leverages are most directly RESTful APIs. FIRE itself, the FIRE standard, is a RESTful API. Um, and this puts it in a, a class of, um, I guess you could say, web standards or, or web uh, communication um, like technologies that is very widely used in the tech field in web programming among like um, communication with a lot of the services that we um, use all the time on the internet. Uh, for example, the Twitter, it, Twitter has a um, REST full search API. Uh, the Git, GitHub pages, or GitHub has its own REST API. Even IBM's Watson Assistant has a RESTful API. So all of these APIs are in the same class uh, as the FIRE um, standard is, which means that um, FIRE is a lot more easily accessed and used by developers in the general developer community by those that are used to work in tech and is not so um, just fo uh, just focused on healthcare and you don't have to be basically an expert in healthcare to feel comfortable using fire because it adheres to a lot of the same web technology standards that are used uh, widely throughout the world. Does that make sense? Um, does anyone have any other ways of putting that? <laughs> okay. Um, just a side note, Slack also has a RESTful API that you can play around with. And I actually um, started playing around with it to try to uh, do some analyses on the Slack Fire channel. Um, so if you get a chance, you can, and are interested, you can take a look at um, this very rough um, analysis and get a better feel for uh, RESTful APIs as well. Okay, so Fire leverages um, being a RESTful API, but what does that mean exactly? Well. Um, First, let's focus on the API part because APIs are a larger group of um, services on the web that RESTful APIs are a subset of. Um, so API stands for an application programming interface. Um, and that's a little confusing and wordy. So I was looking around and found a post that gave a nice um, kind of uh, representation of the idea of an API using non-technical, um, simple terms. Um, so in this case, uh, they represent the API, the client app, and the server as a customer, waiter, and kitchen. So um, if you think of, uh, of this scenario, you have a kitchen which provides some sort of service. Basically, it, it cooks some sort of food um, and delivers that food to their customers who are the clients coming in. Um, however, it's really difficult for the customers in the kitchen to directly communicate because um, the customers don't really have much information about how the kitchen works, what sorts of food it prepares, what the prices are, and the kitchen like works in its own little bubble, um, focusing on the food and can't be bothered to um, determine every customer's needs um, while also working on the time consuming, you know, food preparation. So in this scenario, um, the waiter acts like the API. So the waiter is the interface of the kitchen that the customer sees. So the waiter um, understands both the kitchen and the customer 
and is able to communicate between the two, um, record the requests from the customer, what they want to um, um, order, how they want it made, um, transfer those requests to the kitchen, put it on a little slip of paper, usually in a, put it in a queue in a way the kitchen understands. Um, and then wait for the, the food to be ready and then deliver the requested services or food to the customer. So you can see that the waiter kind of um, puts a simple, intuitive, nice face on the kitchen services, one that the customer is hopefully used to because they're used to the uh, restaurant experience. Um, and one where, uh, and this experience is similar to other restaurants, and one where the kitchen also is not overwhelmed and doesn't have to cater to each individual type of customer. They can just um, communicate well with the waiter that they, in general, communicate well with because they've um, worked together for a while, hopefully. So yeah, um, in summary, um, and you can read through this. I think I worded it a bit better when I had time to um, to think through it. But in summary, an ideal API provides a standardized, well-documented, and convenient endpoint or interface for some clients that are looking for uh, to use the services of some application or service um, to interface with that app or service. So. Um, at this point, I just want to give a quick shout out to Pascal Brandt, who um, in the past has worked in the open MRS community, um, I think pretty extensively. Um, and he's a fellow uh, third, uh, we're now fourth year PhD student um, at um, UW with me. But he created a uh, very quick intro to APIs and FHIR. Um, for a couple of our um, uh, lectures. Uh, so if you have a chance to check this tutorial out and work through it, it might give you a, um, a different and likely better perspective than my quick intro. Okay, so um, let me just pause here and see if... Uh, Anyone has any questions or comments? Nope. Okay. So we talked about what APIs are, but now we have to dive into what the RESTful part of um, the RESTful API means. RESTful APIs are basically a subclass of um, general web APIs that um, do two major things. They uh, represent some objects or concepts as resources, and they define a set of standard operations as on these resources. Um, so for example, for it, the the, if, if we had a Twitter API, um, some resource that they might provide is a post, um, or they might provide a resource that's a like, whatever they, what, however they need to represent their data, their um, services, they model them as resources and then say that there are certain standard operations that um, can be done on them. The Again, the official Fire webpage um, highlights this uh, this concept pretty early on. Um, in the second paragraph of the summary, they note that Fire solutions are built from a set of modular components called resources that can easily be assembled into working systems that solve real-world clinical and administrative problems. So. In other words, they um, fire is composed of a lot of resources that represent um, concepts in healthcare, like patient, clinical encounter, medication, um, and 
basically standardizes how these types of concepts are represented. This is the web page that lists all of the um, resources that are currently included in FIRE in the latest release. Um, and it's actually a pretty cool page because you can browse it in a couple of different ways. Um, here, they characterize the resources by um, category, um, but I also like looking at them by maturity, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, because it shows which resources have kind of been accepted as normative and which ones are a little less, um, less uh, teased out and uh, implemented or, or defined right now. Anyway, um, if we go back to uh, the tutorial, the second part of the RESTful, um, the, the fact that FIRE is a RESTful API is um, the operations part. And there are many operations that um, FIRE defines that can be done on resources. But if you just read this first um, sentence, it re really reiterates how um, closely FIRE and RESTful APIs are related. So it says, the RESTful API defines a set of common interactions performed on the repository of type resources. For further information, see extended operations. So if we go to the extended operation, you can get some more info about how these operations work. But um, if you look at these operations themselves, um, you can see that there are um, things like adding a resource or um, deleting a resource or deleting different metadata from a resource. So um, there's a lot of uh, information here about what you can do with these concepts that um, fire models. Okay, um, any questions about the quick intro to RESTful APIs. It must, it might be um, a bit confusing, especially if you haven't used them before, but let me know what's confusing so um, we can both uh, clarify it and I can maybe add some um, clarifications to this post too. Okay. So let's step back a bit and talk about what is actually part of the FIRE standard and what falls out of scope. Um, this kind of reiterates what I was saying and, and presents it a little differently um, and illustrates that the FIRE spec itself is not a one monolithic thing. It has a couple different aspects and can be used um, in a couple different ways. Um, so at the core, it is a simple data exchange um, standard that uses established and widely supported technologies and protocols. And we sort of talked about that, how um, FIRE is an API, which means that it um, is used to um, transfer data between clients and the service that it um, represents. So in clinical terms, for example, if a EHR system has a FIRE endpoint, then any apps or clients that want to access um, the clinical data in from that FIRE endpoint, um, basically send a request to that endpoint and then receive the data in the FIRE format as FIRE resources. And this will become much more um, clear when we do the tutorial because you'll actually see what these resources look like and um, how they uh, how they basically uh, travel from the server to the client. But for now, um, we'll just move on to some other general definitions. So fire. You can also think of it as a well-defined framework for health data, healthcare data interoperability with a simple system for extensions. Um, basically, FIRE was designed to represent the majority of healthcare scenarios and then provide um, 
a system where you can easily extend it to cover, let's say that other 20% that um, is not covered by the core standard. Um, and we'll talk about how um, quickly, how this extensibility works a little bit later on. Um, it also, like we just talked about, is a set of resources that model the healthcare domain. Um, we just uh, covered this pretty thoroughly, so I'll move on from that one. Um, and it is also a set of extended operations that specify common actions. Again, that's the second part of the RESTful API, the operations part that we just looked at. Um, and then finally, it supports um, other metadata messages, persistence. It, it basically has um, a lot of support for kind of housekeeping actions or other actions that are necessary to have um, a good healthcare data set, data set. But we won't go into those um, aspects very deeply because there's a lot to talk about and um, and this is just an intro. <laughs> and finally, it does have a relatively robust developer and implementer communities. Um, they are not up to the standards of some of the big um, big uh, tech uh, projects out there, but it's still much better than, um, I think, previous efforts in healthcare. So quickly, let's just talk about what FHIR is not. So it is not a complete model of healthcare. It's not a complete model of healthcare data, or it doesn't aim to represent um, every aspect of healthcare perfectly. Um, it basically, FHIRE is not restrictive at all, like the second um, bullet says. FHIRE itself just defines um, resources and then it, it lists attributes of these resources um, in a way that um, does not limit other attributes, but just shows what, um, what some general ones could be. Um, to actually restrict fire further, which is in many cases necessary for two um, systems to be able to communicate um, and talk about the same concepts in the same way. Um, for example, use the same, uh, let's say, uh, use the same units for blood pressure or same units for temp body temperature. Um, those things have to be decided on um, and they're not decided on in FHIR. That's what FHIR profiles are for and other um, ways of restricting the spec. And again, this is a little out of scope of this um, talk, but um, I'll have some information later on how you can find more resources on these topics. It is not fully backwards compatible. Um, the new version has, it does um, break some compatibility with um, previous versions. And that's mainly because FHIR is such a quickly developing spec that is just now reaching relative maturity. Um, so they didn't, I don't think they wanted to hamstring themselves by having to um, be compatible with whatever they came before in the spec. It is also not a security specification. We'll talk about how Smart on Fire provides one option for adding security to Fire. And as I talked about before, it is not a mechanism for semantic interoperability. That's a really, um, th that concept basically means that just because two services are using Fire, two, two um, individuals are using Fire, does not mean that they magically will be able to perfectly talk to each other. There need to be other um, other things in place like profiles to make sure that, that that semantic interoperability that everyone knows exactly what they're talking about is true. Again, a little out of scope of this talk, but let me know if you're interested in this and I can definitely talk to you a lot more about that. I'll continue 
down this because we just went through both of these slides. Um, but but yeah, basically that gives you guys an overview of like a bird's eye view of what fire is and what fire isn't. Um, so in summary, um, fire provides a framework for the representation of healthcare data and methods for sending, sending and retrieving this data. Um, it, this is exciting because FHIR has the potential to basically be the language um, of healthcare for all kinds of healthcare apps and services. Um, and as a result, make it much easier for um, new services to communicate with, with what's out there already and for services to share the um, data in the right way so that, um, for example, your uh, your uh, patient portal works well with your EHR or whatever the case might be. Are temporarily unavailable. Please try again in a few minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I think I said something that um, triggered my Alexa because she got confused. Okay. Any questions so far? That was a very whirlwind introduction. And um, so let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Um, if no one has more questions about like the the general um, concepts of fire and what why it was created, what um, what problems it was um, meant to solve, I'll quickly go on to um, something that I hinted on in this section that if fire becomes the language of healthcare. Um, it can be used in many other um, by many other projects to uh, solve very interesting, uh, basically problems in this uh, in this industry. Um, so this uh, screen here basically summarizes some of the projects that I'm most familiar with that um, use fire and have gotten both uh, buy-in from the FHIR community and even become part of HL7, like the FHIR bulk data access. Um, the first one is CDS Hooks. I'm not sure if um, any of you have heard about it, but basically CDS Hooks um, is a event-driven clinical decision support standard that uses FHIR um, to uh, be able to use triggers that happen in an electronic record system, EHR, to send out um, data and receive um, clinical support from any arbitrary service. It's actually, it's a, it's a really cool standard and very simple. Um, if you go to the webpage, um, this diagram here basically sums up everything that CDS hooks do. So you have some sort of um, EHR with a fire server, and you also have a EHR that's running some sort of basically, let's say a doctor is using an EHR, um, orders a medication, that medication order triggers an event called a CDS hook, and that CDS hook um, invokes a remote service, any service. This can be any sort of um, application that you write, that you decide to provide, as long as it's connected to the internet and can com communicate using the standard, um, it can um, work with CDS hooks. This um, service gets um, fire data from the fire server that this uh, EHR is running on, and then, um, you know, does any sort of compilation it wants. In this case, um, it looks at what information it got um, from 
the EHR on what medication was ordered, and then returns one of three types of um, what CDS uh, Hooks calls cards, um, which are basically bits of advice or, or outputs from the CDS service. Um, and they can be one of three different categories. They can be an information card, where it's just um, some text sent back, maybe information about, in this case, the um, medication that was ordered. It can be a suggestion card that, um, that not only has information, but also has some action on it where um, the uh, user can decide to press the button to accept or maybe decline the action. Or finally, it can send back a card to a, a, a smart application, which we'll talk about in a second when we talk about Smart on Fire, but basically suggesting a solution for um, giving the, the data that it has um, for using some sort of app that might help with the um, clinical situation for the user. So um, that's CDS Hooks. Uh, it, it is basically built on fire because all of the data um, that gets transferred between the EHR fire server all of the medical data that gets transferred between the CDS services and the EHR and um, is in the form of fire and the um, and basically any representation of healthcare in this spec uses the fire standard so does anyone have any questions on CDS hooks okay so the second um, really exciting technology that's that we'll quickly talk about that's based on fire are smart on fire apps smart on fire um, which you can see if you click this um, link they they say they are a tech stack for health apps um, and smart on fire is also very closely linked to the fire api and uses um, fire to represent all of the um, medical data that the standard uses. What Smart on Fire actually adds is a way for, um, for authentication to happen. So basically um, a pure fire server, a pure fire endpoint. So um, if let's say you have a EMR and you can access the, the EMR's data um, in the FHIR format um, using the FHIR specification it does not mean that um, there's any mechanism for controlling, you know, uh, who has access to this data, for authenticating users, for setting their permissions, for scoping, making sure that the data, that the resources that um, should be only available to um, a given user are, can only be seen by that user. So um, what Smart on Fire adds is a, another spec that's widely used uh, in um, web programming, which is called OAuth2. Um, and OAuth2 is basically a spec that um, is used for authentication on the internet and you've definitely run across it if, for example, you ever decided to sign on to some website or service using your Google um, account or your Facebook account or any other, or your GitHub account. Um, all those types of sign-ons are um, use OAuth uh, to, to handle the authentication process. So basically, Smart on Fire takes Fire, adds on OAuth, and as a result, um, it provides a tech stack for health apps, which means that it provides a way for, um, for applications to authenticate with and run on a Fire platform. Um, and again, I, I can't really go too far into this, but um, if you would like some more info on Smart on Fire, um, 
there are a couple of um, links here that I added. There's also this tutorial that um, we made uh, for the uh, for a fire conference that we ran last year that you can take a look at. So if you click on that, um, this tutorial kind of gives you a full overview of um, Smart on Fire, what it is and how it works. And just so you get a, a better idea of what Smart on Fire um, enables, basically it enables um, this sort of uh, application gallery in healthcare or an app store or um, a place where um, you can browse applications and select the ones that you want to add to your EHR in a similar fashion that you might um, right now on your mobile phone go to your app store and select apps that you want to run on your mobile phone. So basically Smart on Fire makes it um, possible for EHRs or for fire enabled EHRs to um, act as application platforms for a um, wide range, uh, wide fa family of interoperable healthcare apps. And these types of apps are already being um, developed. You can see um, a one list here in the um, Smart on Fire or Smart Health app gallery, but there are many other galleries, both um, specific to um, EHR vendors or um, basically open for uh, because they're uh, related to a sandbox. Again, that's a lot of information um, very quickly. So let me know um, if you would like to dive more deeply into it. Um, and I will definitely let you know where to get started, but this is a great place to start these links here. Um, the CDS hooks, um, uh, that we just talked about also, um, if you want to take a deeper look into that technology, play around with, um, some tutorials, I listed two tutorials here that I'll fix the formatting for, but. Um, there's a tutorial that um, we created as part of UW Tire, and then there's a pretty excellent Cerner tutorial for CDS services that um, you can check out. Okay. Give me one second so I can turn off these annoying messages if I can figure out how. Eh, whatever. Um, oh, maybe this. Okay. <sighs> Any questions so far? Okay. So keep going. Um, I just wanted to quickly highlight some other uh, projects that currently also use Fire. So Apple Health, um, which you might have heard of, um, uses the Fire standard for their communications with EHRs. Um, you can see that they even advertise it here, built with industry standards, the connection between your electronic health record and the user's health app utilizes Fire. Um, and they actually um, mentioned the Argonaut project, which I also won't go into, but I um, highlight uh, further down in the resources. Um, it's basically a consortium between um, this some industry players in fire like Epic and others that um, try to implement or try to create implementation guides um, to guide how the spec is actually implemented. Um, again, a lot more in on that topic. So feel free to dive in if you're interested. Um, 
Google and AWS also have recently um, gotten into um, working with Fire, so you can read more about that here on your own. Uh, but I just wanted to quickly bring up an important part, point that we were sort of hinting at, which is that there's a big difference between developing a healthcare standard or a specification, specifying like um, what it should represent, how what the resources should be, what attributes the resources should have, um, what operations should be allowed on these resources. That's a very difficult task and requires input from many stakeholders, but is much different than actually using that spec, that standard in implementations. Um, and the fire specification um, is is uh, pretty extensive at this point, and um, it many of the resources have gone through iterations and have risen in maturity and have been approved by the community. But that whatever the fire specification is. Um, it doesn't mean anything unless that specification gets com correctly implemented. Uh, and right now, the implementations of FHIR that, um, that have happened, so for example, there's EHR vendors that have implemented FHIR endpoints. There's many different implementations that have um, been out there for a couple of years already. Most of them are not up to date with the newest uh, developments of the fire spec. So most of them are still on previous versions of fire. Um, and even if they're on a previous version of fire, they still might not support all of the operations and resources that, and actually most of them don't support um, all the operations and resources that fire specifies. Um, so they support a subset of resources and a subset of re operations on them. For example, um, they might not, they might only support reading for clients reading some resource, so reading patient information, but not support the clients sending back um, updated patient information to be stored in the EHR. So it's really important as we as a community think about what fire can bring to open mrs um, and how we can implement it to have that distinction in mind that the fire specification is just a framework and whether it's successful or not in um, our case or in a specific implementation depends a lot on that implementation and on whether fire is used correctly or not correctly um, I mean, that's not the only um, factor um, that factors into success, but it's, I think, a very large one. Um, anyway, that's, that's basically what I wanted to say about implementation. Does anyone have any questions or comments on that? Okay. Let's see. Let me just quickly find. So right now we'll go on to a Fire API tutorial, and then I'll talk about some other ways you can explore this stuff on your own. We won't really go into the advanced Fire topics here, so reach out to me, um, comment on the talk post if um, you're interested. Um, and yeah, and then we'll be done, and then we'll open up the floor to any conversations that or questions that people will have. Um, so quickly, I, I'm just going to show you in the tutorial, um, I added a link to this notebook. To get this notebook up and running, um, you have to have Jupyter Notebooks installed, so let me know if um, if you run into any issues with that. But once you do that, um, you can download um, the notebook 
either directly from uh, GitHub or clone this project and run it on your own um, computer. Let's see if it shows up correctly. Okay, so um, this is a notebook that was actually, uh, I think started by Viet Nguyen, who is um, a MD that does a lot of fire uh, teaching from for HSPC, which is an organization that actually has a really cool fire um, sandbox or that and smart on fire sandbox and a lot of other developer tools for um, development. Um, I'll link to it. I think I do link to it in the resources, so I'll show you guys later. But basically, um, in this tutorial, we um, look at a use case of a physician who wants to calculate their patient's cardiovascular risk using the Framingham calculator, um, which is based on um, the levels of LDL cholesterol. And you can read more about it um, in this reference, but basically um, it is a predictor of 10-year coronary risk. And as you can see, the data that this predictor requires is pretty simple, like the age, their LDL and HDL cholesterol levels, blood pressure, and some other um, aspects about their health, like smoking and diabetes. Um, I just talked about these, so we'll skip this part. Um, so if we start with um, the fact that we need to define what data we need, so we just defined that we need these types of data, we have to then go and identify the fire resources um, that would hold that data um, so that we can know what to query. So if we go to the fire resource list, um, which I'm not going to go in right now, um, we can match up the pieces of information that we need, like patient age, to where that information would be in a fire resource, which is the patient resource. So let's take a look at the patient resource. Um, the patient resource is defined on this page. Um, you can read about um, the some information about what scope of what use this resource was made in, um, for. Uh, the patient resource is pretty self-explanatory. It's supposed to represent a patient in a clinical context. Um, and you can see that um, this resource has an attribute um, called birth date. And this birth date um, records the date of birth for an individual. So if we need patient age, we, um, we need to basically have we need to basically access the patient resource for that patient and access the birth date um, attribute and then subtract today's date from the birth date to get their age. The patient gender is also found in the patient resource right here. Um, and then the two bits of information that are really crucial for the risk calculator are cholesterol levels. Um, it, this is a little more um, complicated to figure out where these values live because uh, you need to, for example, s determine what sorts of units you use for these types of measurements. But basically, cholesterol levels are stored in an observation resource in FHIR. Um, as our blood pressure level levels, uh, as our um, which are also required for this risk calculator, um, these two last bits of information, whether the patient has diabetes or whether the patient can smoke, um, we can find that in the condition one of them in the condition resource. So we can find the um, the diabetes. Um, his status in the condition resource, which you can see here. Um, and we won't go into this right now because uh, there's a lot 
in this resource, but basically you'll see how we read that resource and how we get at the diabetes um, bit of the information. And smoking status is again in an observation resource. So we identified the resources that we need to support our use case. Um, now we have to actually um, retrieve the fire resources to uh, make our calculator work. So first, um, this is a little bit of housekeeping. Um, basically, I'm installing a uh, client package for Python. That's a fire client, which makes all the communications with a fire endpoint much easier because it already implements them and takes um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the busy work out of the um, programming. But basically, yeah, so you need to install the Fire client, client first and then um, import a couple of libraries that are used in this calculator. Make sure you have <clears throat> this message that all the libraries have been correctly loaded because without the Fire client, this whole um, uh, notebook will not work. So now we're going to um, define what fire endpoint we want to use. And in this case, we're going to use a fire endpoint um, provided by, uh, by uh, this uh, organization. So let me see if I can quickly copy this and see if there's any, yeah. So it's a Happy Fire um, server that has some um, some uh, basically uh, fake patient data, some simulated healthcare data for observations, for um, patients, for procedures, for many things um, that we need to access. So we're basically sending all of our requests to this um this server that is booted up to provide fire resources about some group of patients and then um we basically create an instance of the fire client so we can access the data and then we actually send a request to the server that um asks the server, hey, I want information about a patient with this patient ID. So I would have to know a patient ID. And obviously this is a pretty contrived example. So this assumes that I know what patient I want to talk about, but I would um, find my patient ID and send a request to the um, fire endpoint. So to this um, fire endpoint, uh, where did they go? Oops, well, I'll, I'll go back to it later to the fire endpoint that we just looked at um, and asks for information about this patient in the form of a patient resource. So it's reading a patient. And then once I read a patient, we can take a look at um, what information we found about that patient. So we can take a look at the patient's name by querying that patient, we can take a look at their gender, their date of birth. Um, all of these things are sent from the uh, fire server locally and we can access them. And most importantly, you can see that we can access the date of birth because that's one bit of information that we needed for our calculator. And we can also use Python to access today's date with this little um, command. And then um, we cal can calculate the patient's age by subtracting um, today's date from their birth date. And I have to run all of these because otherwise it yells at me. Oops. Okay, um, so once we have that information, 
we can um, basically uh, output it in a single cell, but we still don't have any information about LDL or um, HDL or any of the other clinical um, data that we need for our calculated calculator. So um, in the next um, section, we actually query um, the fire endpoint again and get those observations that will, for that specific patient, have um, have their LDL levels. And you can see that um, we query all of the observations that are connected to the patient that we selected in the first um, in the first uh, section of the tutorial, and then we only look at the observation that has an LDL value that was the most recent, because we will assume that that's the most accurate level of LDL for that patient. Again, a slightly contrived example. And we find that the most recent level is um, 150 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so now that we have the most recent um, LDL level, um, we can get the most recent, um, I think this is the also the LDL level, yeah and get that as 189 milligrams per deciliter. And then we can find HDL with another query to an observation and get 32 milligrams per deciliter. And then we query another observation to get um, the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Then we query the another fire resource which is a um, condition to actually get the information we need for the diabetes part of the calculator and then we finally um, find our last bit of information Sorry, I lost my screen. Wow. Give me one second because there's a weird narrator going on because I think I clicked it, uh, clicked on the shortcut so that it's in my. Uh, Okay, sorry about that. That was a minor inconvenience. Okay, um, so finally, we uh, we have to find the smoking information about our um, patient. So we um, figure out what link code we need for this bit of data. We search. We uh, query the fire endpoint. Um, for the observation that has that loin code and determine whether the patient smokes or not. Okay. And I should probably run this all in order so that um, I don't get these errors. But in general, now that we have all the data, we can calculate um, our risk score um, and basically this this just sums up the Framingham risk calculator so this part of the tutorial implements the logic behind the risk calculator which you can find if you um, follow the references um, but based on these results um, we can calculate the 
risk of the given patient and determine what their 10-year heart disease risk is. The um, FHIR tutorial, the FHIR API tutorial has a couple different options. Um, this one is the one I just went through that's pretty, um, pretty comprehensive and just requires you to run um, each, uh, each cell individually and get the results. I'll make sure that everything works on it um, right after this call um, because I saw a couple errors that I wanted to check out. I don't know if it's because I didn't run them in order or there's some issue, but there's a couple other options that we also made. Um, so this one was based on uh, Viet's uh, tutorial, but these we made for kind of a more open-ended exploration. So um, there are two, um, basically two options for each level. For level two, there's the empty tutorial that requires you to actually put in some of your own code to make it work. And then there are the answers that um, show the fully implemented type. And then the same thing for level three that um, gives you even more flexibility about what kind of uh, fire calculator you would want to create and what fire resources you want to access. And then um, the answers um, show an example that um, uses data for PHQ-9, um, which is a depression scan. Okay, so that's kind of a rough run through the uh, fire tutorial to show you how fire resources could exact could actually be used in a clinical setting. Um, does anyone have any questions about that tutorial or suggestions for um, how it could be presented um, to the group? Okay, so now I'll, I'll probably just wrap up this call with some final thoughts. Um, this was really a whirlwind uh, introduction to FHIR and basically the goal of this was both um, um, for me to meet the community and share some of um, the work and also to give the OpenMRS community an opportunity to learn about the spec because there's a lot of talk right now about um, what FHIR can do in for OpenMRS, whether it's a direction um, the, uh, that the community should go towards. And, and basically, um, those types of decisions are a lot easier to make if um, everyone has at least a general understanding of a technology and not just um, hears buzzwords or promises or, or from random sources around. Um, so if you have any thoughts about how to um, reach out to the OpenMRS community or how to make this um, uh, tutorial better, actually, um, let me know. I want this tutorial itself to be a collaborative effort. Um, and Jennifer and I, we were talking and, and wondering whether we can post this on the OpenMRS um, wiki pages. Um, but for it to go on the wiki pages, I really would appreciate some more feedback from you guys or whoever might be listening to this later on or whoever might be doing this tutorial in the next week or two. Um, just to get a sense for what you think. Okay. Um, I'll leave it at that, but finally, I wanted to just um, give you guys some guidance on how you could explore more of these topics on your own. Um, so the first step would be, again, just look through this whole tutorial. There's a lot of links out to a lot of different resources. Um, if you read through it, it might be a little more coherent than my um, early morning uh, presentation, especially since... I have a six-week-old uh, right now who does not always let me sleep the most. Um, but uh, but yeah, just work through this, this tutorial and 
um, on the OpenMRS talk post. Share any questions or thoughts you might have. Um, check out the links in this section. So um, all of these links link out to either tutorials or technologies that will um, will definitely deepen your understanding of all of these um, uh, concepts. But finally, um, you can read through a much more comprehensive list of um, of resources that we've put together throughout the last couple months um, that uh, that basically give even more introductions to fire. One one very um, useful one might be this uh, Clean Fire tool that you could take a look at because it gives you a very um, intuitive look into um, fire, this fire resources themselves. You can see how they're represented, um, how like in the actual text representation of them and all that. I won't go into that right now, but yeah, let me know if you have any questions because I have a couple of tutorials for ClinFire itself. Okay, um, that's, I think, all I've had to say. Um, does anyone have any questions um, right now? Uh, any other comments, any thoughts? Nope. Okay. Then I'll um, probably end this call in a minute or two. I just wanted to say that the next webinar um, will focus a lot more on OpenMRS, um, previous efforts with Fire and OpenMRS, um, especially the Fire module. Um, and uh, also take a look at the web services that OpenMRS provides today. Um, so hopefully you guys can join then. Um, it should be scheduled for September 11th, um, but I will double check and make sure to send out uh, announcements once I do. So yeah, thanks for listening. Hopefully this has been at least a bit fun for you guys. Um, and um, I'll see you next time.